everyone, I am Victoria Turk from Wired, and I'm delighted to be joined by Ida Tin, uh, co-founder and CEO of Clue. We're going to be talking today about how companies build and honor trust. Uh, so Ida, I thought I'd start by asking a bit about your own story. Uh, Clue is trying to integrate into a very personal aspect of people's lives, particularly mm -hmm. women's lives, um, and to get quite personal information from them. When you were starting out, how did you approach that? How did you initially build that trust with your users? So I think we were trying to express where we were coming from. Like, why are we building this app? And who are we? Um, and then we did things like, say, you can use this app without having your data go anywhere except on your own phone. In fact, we made the choice to not offer the solution of us storing the data, because we were a young company, and we were like, we're not ready for this. When we ask people to trust us with their data, we want to know that we are as good as we can be. And it actually took us, I think, two years till we felt we were like, OK, now we can do this. So that was the first big decision to really kind of take it seriously, that we're not going to ask for somebody's data till we feel really, really confident about it. And why is that so important to you as a business to, to build that level of trust with people? So first of all, I think it's, for me as a person, it's the right thing to do. That's my own ethics. You know, I think that when you ask people to share very intimate data, it needs to be a very transparent exchange so that people understand what do they give and what do they get. And so I think it's both... Um, right and needed. And the reason why I think it's needed is because what I really want to do is help people navigate their bodies and their lives. I can't do that if they're not willing to share their very intimate data with me. So I can't provide the value to the user that I'm hoping to give unless they trust me with their data. So I have to do it. But I also think it's the right thing to do. I also think it's the future, but that's a second part, maybe. So from the ethical standpoint, it's, it's the right thing to do. As a company, does it, does it give you other advantages as well? What's the business argument, I suppose? The business argument. So, you know, we're heading into a future, or we're already in a future where everything is creating data points and data streams and, you know, figuring out how does data flow in the world? You know, who aggregates data? What is their intention? What's their purpose? What do they do with it? You know, there is very little transparency at the moment into that whole flow and exchange. And some companies take advantage of that, right? They, you know, they track your behavior without me as a user being aware. And I think as awareness you know, goes up in the public, we'll start to be like, hold on, you're, you're tracking this, you're creating this data, and I don't have access, access to it. I can't amend it. I can't port it. You know, I can't question it. That doesn't feel good. And I think there will be a higher and higher demand from users to really understand you know, what data are you creating? What do you do with it? And it needs to be in the user's interest. It really should be. And I do believe that there is a lot of wonderful things we can do with data. And we should do them. And people would, you know, they will see the benefits as well, right? It's, it's great that Netflix can recommend me a movie that I'm really going to enjoy. And we can do the same in health. But it needs to be based on this concept that I want to give you this data, and I understand what you do with it so that I can benefit. And then I, as a business, will also benefit because I can give you what you want. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do users care that much about it? Do they currently understand? Do, are they demanding that transparency that you're seeking to give? The really honest quest, uh, answer is I, I don't know for sure. I mean, we have people who are vocal who's, you know, who ask us and are very aware. I think probably the truth is that they that there's a great proportion of people who, if they knew, would care. But it's just black box. They don't think about it. Um, but I think more and more people will know. Um, but I mean, the world could go in a direction where people say, post privacy, you know, I'll share, you know, I'll trade my, my privacy and my data to get a free service. The world could go in that direction. But I hope and want to, and trying to create another direction, which is, more understanding of data is a really key thing we need to manage and understand as individuals and build services that honor kind of that relationship. 
And you talked about uh, with Clue being very transparent with your users uh, about the data you're using and how you're using it. How do you communicate that to people? How do you help them to, to understand? <laughs> it's actually a, it's an educational task. So one of the things we've done is that you know, our terms of service is written in a language that is understandable. We really we try to highlight it, encourage people to actually read it. Um, we did a writing which was trying to explain what happens when you do a data entry into Clue. Where does the data go? Where is it stored? What third uh, party providers have access to what kind of data, right? Really trying to explain for users how does this data flow. I don't know how many read it, but I was pretty proud of that piece of writing because it was really educational. It was like, and this is helpful information, not just for Clue, but for any service that you use. Um, yeah. Wow, well, you're maybe the first person I've met who said you're really proud of your terms of service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Now, um, as well as Clue, you're well known for coining the term femtech and being a, sort of an advocate for that sector of technology designed uh, for women. Do you think building things for that community, does that influence the way that you treat your users at all? Or are they, do they have different demands, maybe? Or have you noticed any trends? I think the first thing to even say is to recognize that there is you know, needs um, that women have because of their biology that technology can help solve. Um, that's a, it sounds so simple, but like, you know, it hasn't been there until now. Like, if you look at family planning, there has been no innovation since the pill came out 70 years ago. Like, that's very long in the history of technology. So now there is a thing happening where a lot of people are starting to tackle small areas of female health. They're building products and services and companies. And it, it's really great. It's really great. And I think it's, you know, it's still young, and we haven't started seeing these services kind of cluster together and really build on each other. I think that's the next generation that will happen within femtech. Um, but there is so much to be done. Oh my god, I mean, there is so many unmet needs still in female health. There's a ton of opportunity in, for technology um, and for investors to start looking at this space. Does that affect the relationship that you're building with people? The fact that you know, a lot of this data is very sensitive, it's, um, a lot of it is health data or, mm. or intimate data. How does that yeah. influence your relationship with consumers? I think it, I think, first of all, it means that you have to have a relationship with the user. You have to really understand where they're coming from. I mean, one, one thing that we think a lot about is the emotional intelligence when you build a product. It's not just about collecting data, mirroring the data back. You need to interpret the data, and you need to help people understand what does this mean. And you have to kind of, you know, female health and health in general is very intimate. You know, it's close to our hearts. It's related to our sexuality, our identity, our big life decisions. So we need to, as a company, we need to really meet people where they are. And so I think that, that does affect, you know, the relationship is like, you know, I need to, I mean, of course, everybody needs to understand their users, but I think here it's not just understanding like a black and white need, it's really understanding the whole, kind of the wholeness of what that needs does to somebody in their lives. It's pretty complex. <laughs> and I know you have, um quite a vision for how things could change in the future, and you alluded to, you just alluded to that as well. Um, how do you think things will change with data use and data sharing as you get more information a, a, about people? What will that allow you to do, and how will that change your company as well? So right now, there are so many areas where understanding female health is not playing a role. I mean, how you develop medicine, you have kind of traditionally not tested it on women because they had cycles and it was very inconvenient. Now it's like, oh, actually, maybe we should start understanding that instead of ignoring it. And that goes for, I mean, it, it goes for things like disease detection, or it goes for understanding sleep, or it goes for understanding moods, or like there's so many areas of life where if you overlay the data set of what's happening in your cycle. And your, your, so cycle is the whole thing. Remember that. It's not just your period. It's actually like the whole thing that goes on for 40 years. You will start understanding correlations that we've never understood before. And I believe that when people start having longitude data sets, they, we will be able to start doing something like, say, detect something like ovarian cancer, which 
at the moment is very hard to detect and usually it gets detected so late that people die from it. When in fact, it's very treatable if you detect it early. This is just one example. But I think people that have this longitude data set, it'll start being something like a health insurance. Like you will, you know, you will really start being able to take care of your health and do preventive things in a way that you can't do at the moment. Um, and of course, these kind of data sets you can't buy for money, right? So I think there will be, you know, start, start having data around your body. I think it will become this thing that people know is kind of a valuable asset to have. And from there, we can do many, many things with it. What will it take to get to that place where you've got that really longitudinal data and layers of very different data, perhaps things that you didn't even realize might correlate? How, how do you get to that position? So what we're trying to do at Clue is really build this platform where we can take all this data and overlap it. And um, what will it take? It'll take a little bit of time. <laughs> um, but again, I, I see all this activity in the femtech space. And I think we'll start seeing you know, small ecosystems emerging that we can um, that help. So for the user right now, it's a totally fragmented experience, right? My, you know, my period tracking app doesn't talk to my doctor, that doesn't talk to my DNA test, that doesn't talk to my prenatal screening. And we need to start bringing these things together so we can build something like a female health graph. Um, and it's, it's, it's coming. It's, we're, we're working on it every day at Clue. <laughs> yeah. And how do you keep control of that so that the right people have access, your doctor, your health advisor, uh, but the wrong people don't have access? I think the key concept is that the user is in control. The user will be the one saying, I want this data set to go there, or this segment of my data to be seen by this person. An example of that that is already implemented is that at Clue, there is a feature called Clue Connect, where a user can choose to invite somebody that they trust to see a high-level set of her data. So it can be a romantic partner. You know, just, it's helpful that if my boyfriend knows when I'm about to maybe experience bad moods, or my peer is about to come, or the times where I can become pregnant. So again, it's the user who can, in one click, say, no, now I don't want to share this data anymore. Um, I think, you know, again, I, in, in my view, and maybe there's you know, certainly lots of things I don't know, and this might be one of them, is that you know, how, how is all this data really going to flow between doctors, um, apps, health insurance, your workplace, like this whole flow of data, I think is still so early that we don't really know yet, but I think there are really good principles to build around, which is the user needs to own the data, the user needs to be in control, they need to be able to port the data, to amend the data, like these key things. And then from there, we can, you know, we have to find practical solutions. And, and as the technology is developing, so too are regulations around data. And in particular, next year, we've got uh, GDPR coming in yep. in Europe, the new data protection regulations. Does that affect your work at all? So I was going through it. Um, and I will say, I think Clue is in a very good space to be compliant. I feel that some of the early investment we did in this kind of thinking around data is now actually really um, paying off. Um, on a very practical level, we have very little work to do um, <clears throat> to be compliant. There is actually only one point. Uh, so from May, users that are under 16 will have to have parent consent to use an app like Clue. I think that is highly problematic, not only because it's a headache for us to solve, but we'll solve that. But I think what you're doing is that you're limiting access to health information and health education for the people who really have you know, a great need to get off in the right direction in life and for whom it's difficult to go to your parents and say, you know, to have that conversation or even your doctor. And honestly, you know, I'm all in for regulations. I think it's an absolutely needed thing. I just think this is one point where maybe we should see if we need to tweak the policies to actually promote female health for the really young girls. That's so needed. Yeah, yeah so that's something that's coming in across the board. It's the, the 16... Yeah. Age limit up Before it was 13 years old, now it's 16 years old. And I do think that's not help helpful for the people we're trying to protect. Is that something that you're working on, or do you know how you're going to address that? Um, so we have created a little gathering of femtech CEOs and, and founders. And we've gathered twice in New York. 
And I think this is a great thing to maybe try and have some collective voice on, but I, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great. Um, and finally, we're coming close to the end of our time here, but what advice would you maybe give to the, the, the other founders and the startups out there, a lot of whom will be working on products that uh, need to collect data in order to work and to offer something to their users? What words of wisdom would you share with them? I, I don't think there are like corners to cut. I think, I think you need to be really solid and do what you know is right all the time, every time, and communicate that to users. I, I, I cannot promise that's going to be the winning strategy, but I really want it to be. And I think if we all do it, it will be the winning strategy. You know, it's, I don't know, that's the kind of company I want to build, and I hope that's also the kind of company you want to build. <laughs> and what can we expect to see next from Clue? Making more sense of the data. I think that's really the key. Like, you know, we have a, you know, an amazing amount of data now, and we're, we're really getting our heads down to figure out how can we provide more value back to the users based on the data. So that's a key thing. We also want to be a sustainable business. So we are also figuring out how to make money in ways that feel good for the user as well. Um, again, very transparent. It's one of the reasons I really want to have a very visible business model so people understand how we make money. That's another way of building trust. So, you know, we have been venture, or we are venture backed, and we haven't made money yet. It has been a free product. And then people, some people say, we assume that you're selling my data since you're free. And we're like, no, 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 we are not. But it, you know, it highlights for me that you need to show users how you make money, because now there is there's so much negative connotation to data that people just assume that you are doing something nasty with the data. And if you are not, you need to actually actively do something to, to show how it works. And um, how do you plan to make money? What, what is your business model? So we are still early and doing lots of different experiments. Um, but I think in our enabling and allowing people to dive much deeper into the data and get more out of the data is something that people will be willing to pay for. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Ida. It's been a great conversation. And I look forward to seeing what Clue does yeah. next. Thank you so much. Thank you.